it's so weird. I love the term paradoxical intention because that, yeah, yeah, it is recognizing everything in your body is saying, no, don't do this. And you're mm -hmm. saying, oh no, actually this is the indicator that we, we yeah. want to go and do more of this. Yeah. And then the brain starts to go, oh, I, 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 I was wrong about that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I don't we're, have to keep worrying about that. psychology in the brain. We're like, exactly. The, brain, the exact opposite of what, what it would normally want to hear, mm -hmm. but we're kind of, you know, we're, we're one step ahead, you know, we're two, we're two steps ahead. Um, but you know, funny enough with, um, did you know you can get over OCD? Cause that's the thing you can do. And this week's adventures in brains, I'm going to be speaking with Nova Sutton. My name is Mark Freeman, and what I'm really curious about is Nova's experience of recovery from OCD. Welcome, uh, and for everybody uh, tuning in, uh, this is Everybody Has a Brain, uh, where we explore adventures and experiences with real human brains. Uh, today, our human brain joining us uh, is Nova Sutton. Uh, and so, Hi, Nova, everyone. you're, yeah, say hello. Say hello to everybody. Hi. Uh, <laughs> No, but you're, you're uh, trained in CBT and ACT. Uh, mm -hmm. You help people with OCD. You yep. also have your own experience of uh, recovery from OCD. And I do. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm really excited to explore that today because one of the things that often comes up in my work is people saying like, oh, I don't, I don't see people talking about recovery. And I think, yeah, in, so, in some ways that's, that's kind of great. People can go and recover from a mental illness and then head off and do all the things they wanted to do and kind of just leave it behind. Uh, but also it's awesome when people uh, go through that adventure and then come back with those skills and share mm -hmm. them with others. And I think it's, yeah, it's great that we can share about that experience mm -hmm. to kind of demystify um, recovery. So I'm really Love excited that. to explore that uh with you today and maybe absolutely yeah, yeah maybe let's yeah let's get yeah. into your your experience and your story uh yep Amazing. when did you start to notice there was something up with mental health okay so for me it was at the age of seven that i first noticed that something wasn't quite right I'd at the time been going through a lot of difficulties in my home life. My, my parents were in the process of separating. My dad was unfortunately an alcoholic, you know, abusive at times. And my, my mum had fallen into a really, a really dark depression. And I'd taken on such a, a kind of a big role at that point in my life. I became almost like a surrogate parent and, and, you know, spouse almost to, to my mum who, who needed me at the time. And I would look after my siblings and, you know, I would make sure that they were fed and, you know, they went to bed and read them to, you know, read them to sleep. And, and at the time, you know, I it used to be described as, you know, mummy's little helper, you know, it was, it, it, it was seemingly, you know, a very innocent thing that the role that I had kind of, you know, fallen into. But I think what had happened at that point was I had developed a, a really high, you know, overinflated sense of responsibility, a sense of importance upon my ability to make everything better, make everything perfect and, and as it should be. And I felt really responsible when I saw my mum crying, when I saw any violence in the house, when I saw anything that wasn't right. I started to believe that these things were happening because I somehow couldn't prevent them or somehow I hadn't been good enough and so really that's the point where OCD had taken root for me um, I'd started to really become quite critical of myself there was a, a really defining point for me uh, when uh, this is Christmas Eve when I was seven and I remember the first OCD thought that I'd ever had which was just a thought that popped in out of the blue that was, you know, you don't deserve Santa. You have, you know, told your mom, told your, your parents that you're buying fruit with the money they're giving you at school. And in fact, you went and bought ice lollies. You know, you went and bought something that you hadn't, you know, told them that you were supposed to buy. And, you know, they're going to leave because of that. You know, they're going to think you're a terrible person and, and you are, you're evil. And 
from that point on, that's really when it just it just spiraled from there. I, I just became fixated on any wrongdoing, anything that could potentially cause harm, upset people. I I really, really, you know, felt this the shift in me. And as I got older, it just it just matured with me. So, I mean, I've lost count of the amount of different themes that my OCD has covered. You know, it's it's covered, you know, all of the themes at one point. Um, and, and it got more and more dark uh, as I got older. You know, you, mm. you, you only have a point of reference uh, for what you have a point of reference. And, and as you get older, you're exposed to far more. So for me, it, it just seems to escalate as I got older. And it had gotten to the point where I was you know, really severely, you know, affected day in, day out. It was all consuming. I'd, I'd gotten to a point, you know, in early adulthood where I just couldn't leave my house. I, I really couldn't live a functional life. And I I felt extremely hopeless. I felt as though my world had become so small, so incredibly small. Um, it was debilitating. And at that point, that was when I reached a crisis point. Um, I, I felt as though I couldn't carry on and I'd ended up in hospital and that's really when I started the process of being diagnosed with OCD up until that point I'd been back and forward to doctors who had said to me you know you're depressed or you know you've got a bit of anxiety the, my favorite one was it's just teenage hormones that was the one that came up quite frequently um, and you know all harmless and innocent but at the time it, you know it, it can be quite challenging to get a diagnosis you know it can take people many many years and in the process of that happening I felt really misunderstood quite scared in fact to open up about a lot of my my thoughts and uh, finally at this crisis point I had eventually been able to get this diagnosis get this answer and I'd been put on a waiting list and I was kind of sent off to to see some specialists and to my kind of shock, uh, the individual specialist that I saw, it it wasn't the best experience for, for myself personally. Yeah. Now, this isn't for me to say that any other person is going to have the same experience. There are incredible specialists and therapists out there that do wonderful things for, for people with mental health, for people with OCD. This is my personal experience. Um, but I, you know, I had incidents where I had... A particular specialist who I'd finally built the courage up to express, you know, some of my harm, OCD thoughts and one particular real event thought that I had been struggling with. And I was then asked as a follow up, you know, do you really think you could harm somebody? Do we need to put procedures in place? And you can imagine, I'm, 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 I don't know if you've ever had an experience like that, but it kind of sent me into a spiral. Um, I'm not sure if that's anything that you've kind of come across in, in your own journey. Um, but for me, that really was quite a, a knockback uh, in terms yeah. of trying to actually access help. Um, but I did eventually reach out and find somebody who taught me the, the foundations of ERP, which is the gold standard and can be hugely, hugely helpful for people in overcoming their fears and desensitizing um, for myself at that point though I wasn't quite ready for that I wasn't quite at the point where I could fully engage with it and I kept kind of getting to a certain point and then feeling as though I just couldn't find that motivation to really do the work to really put myself in that situation and I realized at that point that it was that I hadn't I felt, I think, deep down that I didn't deserve to recover. I think that's what it was. I just had this kind of unconscious programming running underneath the surface that kind of made me feel as though I just didn't deserve it. And so that's really where my journey began. That's where I, I really went on my journey of self-discovery and started to make massive changes in my life and how I viewed OCD in general, that's a really big one. Changing the relationship with my OCD was crucial. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a really, really kind of transformative period of my life at that stage when I realized the cavalry wasn't coming, <laughs> when I realized that, you know, if I wanted to get better, I, I needed to put the work in. Um, I don't know, um, yeah, that, that would be where the point where yeah where I had that change um, in terms of what I did in terms of how I turned that around I really started to 
to think outside the box, to start to look at my recovery as being a bigger picture, rather than just solely looking at it as a symptom reduction or symptom management, I started to look at it as being, you know, this is an overall project for that, you know, I am transforming not only, you know, the way that I respond to my thoughts, but the the way I view my thoughts, the way I view myself, how I accept myself as a, as a person. Um, and so I, I started to kind of read everything I could, you know, I, I read you know, David Hawkins, Albert Ellis, I, I looked into Jungian shadow work, um, which again is a, one of these things that people tend to think is a really you know, scary prospect. But again, it's about looking at these parts of ourselves that we at some point have been made to believe are unacceptable. And often people think it's really scary. They think it's like, you know, some deep, dark secret, but it can be as subtle as, you know, for example, if you're somebody who, you know, had a really silly side when you were younger and it was met with, you know, wipe that smirk off your face or, you know, we need to be serious now, this is not the time. At that point, a person can make that decision on a subconscious level to bury that part of themselves. And when we bury these parts of ourselves, it causes so much suffering in the present because we're not really aligned with our true selves. We're not aligned with our authentic selves. And that can in itself cause, you know, depression and being out of touch with our emotions. So part of my journey was rediscovering who is Nova, like who was Nova meant to be before OCD got involved and tried to, you know, run the show. Um, and OCD meant well. I, that's just another thing that I always kind of come back to. You know, OCD is not, in my eyes, is not this big, big bad monster, but it's just a really vulnerable part of yourself that has tried to step in and try to help. It's misguided and it's not getting it right. You know, it's hindering you, but it, it at some point maybe served a purpose. It's it's out of date software that we need to update. Um, but yeah, I had to become my own ally. I had to, I had to work with becoming the the parent and the ally that I needed, that I didn't have, that internal voice needed to change. And I also needed to find meaning. Why was I recovering? You know, what was my purpose? Because often that's something that we can lose sight of. You know, why is it that I'm putting myself in this situation? It's not easy, you know? It's not easy to want to sit with your fear. It can be really scary. You know, yeah. I remember days trying to do exposure and just being like you know why am I doing this I'd rather just sit and you know avoid this and and watch watch a you know Rick and Morty or you know watch something else you know just I wanted to kind of just bury my head in the sand at times but I had to at a certain point say you know there's a silver lining to this there's a there's a meaning and a, a purpose to why I am putting myself in this situation you know there's a really a really great quote by I think it's Nietzsche who says he who has a why will go through no he who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow and and that really sums it up for me you know if you have a strong enough reason why you're doing it then you can endure it and you can come out the other side um i don't know i mean what, what about you you know you when you were going through your 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 kind of erp and your treatment what was your kind of your motivation like what, what kind of got you through it what got you to kind of engage in the work similar to you talking about you know finding who nova is the way i really thought about it at the time was that i i was acting as somebody i wasn't and there had been this huge gap mm. created between who i was yeah. and then this other life that i was living and I did see that all of these mm-hmm. things I wanted to do, I couldn't do. Yeah. And so that was a big yeah. part of it for no, me. So know. it was seeing that there was this gap and I wanted to close that gap. Mm. I love that. I love that. And you are, you have, you know, the work that you do is incredible and you're obviously far more aligned now with your values. And um, I mean, one of the things that, and I, I feel as though from what you've kind of gone on to do, that, that this is probably true for you, but you know, part of the, the meaning and the purpose maybe to the suffering 
that you've been through is the fact that you've come out far more compassionate, understanding and able to, to do the work that you do now to help so many other people. And I think that's that's a beautiful thing to, to be able to look at the pain and the difficulties and to see that it's turned into something that's helping so many other people. Um, that I mean, that's my opinion on, on what you do. Uh, you might disagree, but, um, but yeah, I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, yeah. Oh no, thank you, thank you. Well, let's let's explore though your like your why there. Like yeah. what what was the the that kind of big why that that took you through that? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, very similarly to 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 yours. You know, I I wanted to be the person that I needed when I was struggling. I wanted to be somebody that championed the person that had been through what I'd been through and didn't feel like they had a place to turn, didn't feel as though they had somebody who could offer them that compassion, that acceptance and just see them. I felt so unseen for such a long time. You know, I was the black sheep in my family unit. I had a lot of conflict. I'd been repeatedly criticized, told that I wasn't, you know, it was always very covert. It would always be, you know, you you haven't quite, you know, met our expectations, you're not quite bright enough, you're not quite this. And there was a a lot of kind of really covert things that were constantly being kind of planted in me. And I had a lot of self-doubt, which really thrives, you know, with OCD, you know, it's kind of uh, almost comical, Um, but I did. um, And I used to feel extremely lonely. I remember sitting in my room and, you know, just wishing as a teenager that just one person would get what I was going through and be able to help me understand what was going on in my head. I, I mean, I felt, there were times where I, f- I felt like I was possessed even. I used to Google, you know, am I possessed? Am I a bad person? What's wrong with me? Um, and I think it's a really, really sad state of affairs when when you're at that point where you genuinely think that there's something inherently wrong with you for just being human, for just experiencing human emotions, for, for your brain functioning as all humans' brains do, but because you have such a negative, low opinion of yourself you've added all of this additional meaning um, and there are still people out there that that unfortunately are in that situation and my heart goes out to those people and I think that was my motivation um, and also my motivation was you know to rise above what I'd been through you know the people that had put me down the bullies um, the people that weren't you know there for me to live a good life in spite of what had happened to live a good life that that meant something that had meaning to it so yeah that would be why where I found that motivation and it gets easy you know as you work on that relationship with yourself as you start to become an ally it's easy to find meaning and it's easy to find things that that bring you joy whether that be you know that you're into you know music or you're a creative person a lot of the people that I work with are incredibly creative I think that the OCD community in general is just super talented and creative the amount of musicians and painters and singers and there's just so many of us and I think that, you know, as you kind of rediscover that, there's so many kind of areas that you can go into in terms of, you know, what could you, what could you say with music? What could you express with art? What could you, what message, what wisdom could you share with the world? How could you make the world better for the next generation of OCD sufferers? The, oh, all, there's so much in what you're describing that's so... Uh, useful to see so yeah one thank you for sharing all this because I think it's so useful for people to see the to the what can be the complexity of the journey and like like you were saying they're both you know the people who had put you down over the years but then even that experience you had with that specialist Mm -hmm. takes something that's a very human experience experiencing Mm -hmm. thoughts about harm and yeah. suddenly puts it in this kind of very alienating position, right? Because the, mm-hmm. the, I would say the skilled and experienced response when that comes up is going, yeah, yeah, you're yeah. thinking about <laughs> killing people, it's a Tuesday, great, like congratulations, <laughs> like you're yeah. a human and it's a Tuesday. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, to be like, whoa, like, right? You can see them immediately attaching meaning, interacting mm-hmm. with their own anxieties yeah, um, and so on. And so it's, because like you were just saying there, it gets it gets easier. Yeah, the more we do the things we want to do, we get we start to see, oh, like this is really great. And I can change the things that I yeah. thought were impossible to change. And let's do more of this. Mm. But getting that going uh, can be very challenging. Uh, dealing mm. with things like 
false memories and stuff like that, or yeah. like you're describing the morality stuff where we might think, oh, I'm not deserving or mm. I feel guilty. Mm. It's very difficult to Absolutely. get things moving. Um, yeah, mm. you probably hear people bringing that up a lot. Yeah. How did you... I'd love to hear about like what was the experience between say that that specialist who yeah was not so helpful mm -hmm. um and even yeah you mentioned you know doing ERP at the time that was really yeah. difficult mm -hmm. what was useful in there that helped to get that wheel spinning Mm. So, you know, to restate, you know, ERP is extremely helpful and, and there's definitely a lot that you can take from ERP. I personally found ERP when I was at the right stage in my recovery, yeah. really, really beneficial and it, it helped me immensely. Um, but for myself and for so many people that I've come into contact with, there, there's that added element, you know, often there's so much more going on, you know, there's, there's all these kind of background softwares that are that are kind of influencing the way that we engage in the present. Um, and, and often, you know, self-sabotage can come up um, quite frequently. So for me, it was about looking at secondary gain. It was about looking at what was the, the gain to holding on to OCD. And that is a really, it's, a, it's an unusual concept and, and often one that initially people are like, mm, what do you mean? It's, and obviously I'm not saying that OCD is an enjoyable experience, or something that you want, you know, on a conscious level. And I am speaking from my own experience as well of that I did this as well. I consciously wanted to recover, but subconsciously I was working against myself. So really it was about identifying what it was that I was gaining by chasing it back. So I would start off with the kind of tip of the iceberg being, you know, okay, I'm, for example, with ROCD, I'm, I'm, you know, worried that I, I don't love my partner, for example. Well, why is it that I'm worried that I don't love my partner? Well, if I don't love my partner, then it means that I'm going to have to leave. Okay, what happens if I have to leave? Well, it's going to prove that I'm not capable of, of being loved, truly. It's going to prove that I, I'm not good enough and that I'm broken. Well, why am I scared that, you know, I won't you know, be able to have a relationship and that I won't, you know, have that self-worth. Well, it made me, it reminded me and made me feel worthless. It made me feel as though I was unlovable. And so when I'd identified that, what, what I'd been able to do is draw a comparison to the point in my life, personally, where my father had left. That was the biggest, biggest loss that I'd experienced to have. And I was a daddy's girl. I was really close with my dad. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to say that he was perfect. He wasn't, um, that he, he was less than uh, Stella, but I still, I saw him through rose colored glasses and, and that loss was incredibly painful. And I blamed myself. And in addition to that, my mom uh, really didn't like my dad and would regularly kind of say things, you know, again, when we talk about how we can learn rules and ideas about who we are how we you know our, our kind of core beliefs we can learn them through secondary information secondary sources it doesn't often have to be you know through experiencing ourselves it can be through the verbalization the language that other people use how they respond to situations we can pick up on that and we can we can mirror it and, and take it on as our own value system our own belief system but she'd often been very critical of my father and talked about what a waste of space he was, what a horrible, depressive person he was, how he drank and, you know, how she hated him. And then whenever I got in trouble, it would always be, you're just like your father, right? So I was looking at that and saying, oh, okay, so my dad equals terrible, you know, morally incorrect, he's abusive, he's an alcoholic, he's, you know, he's this monster in my mother's eyes and I'm just like him okay, right, well, we'll run with that then, shall we? <laughs> and so really it was that fear of, of being like my dad, the fear of, of losing people like my dad. And it was so terrifying. And at that point, I must have made a rule that I never wanted to feel that again. I never wanted to feel that pain again. So I locked it in a box and I said, no, nope, I'm not going to feel that. And OCD being the kind of misguided 
knight in shining armor that thinks that it's helping but is you know instead of helping it is massively you know putting you out and, and making your world you know feel very very challenging at the, at the best um came in and said right okay well let's make sure that no one can ever leave you again um by pushing everyone away so we're gonna we're gonna you know have you kind of really closed off really hyper vigilant we're gonna you're gonna always feel on ease like something's not quite right and you know what they can't they can't leave you if you leave first and so really when you start to look at it from that perspective firstly it it massively changes your relationship to the OCD but in addition to that I also started to see the processes behind it so if I could work with that fear around being abandoned and being just like my dad being basically being human having imperfections that's really what the, you know the, the meat and two bones of it is is looking at my dad and saying okay he wasn't perfect he, he did things that, that weren't right and accepting that as a human being we all have the capacity to do both good and bad that doesn't mean we're going to do that but we have the capacity you know the, the buddhists believe that you know for a tree to reach heaven its roots must descend to hell and really that again it sounds scary but we're talking about balance here we're talking about looking at a person and, and seeing the humanity and and seeing the duality in the human essence right but if i could work with that if i could make my peace with that then i could as a result have that bottom up bottom up bottom up effect of being able to kind of take away the power supply of all these different fears because it had manifested in so many different ways you know in terms of my harm ocd it had done the same i you know i was plagued with thoughts of harm you know i used to sit around the dinner table and i'd just be watching a horror show you know i'd be trying to have a conversation with my family and i would just be watching you know something of the same ilk of you know saw or hostile it was just it was just watching a horror show and you know in terms of contamination um again you know often people think contamination is you know that we like to just be clean and neat and and really there's so much more when you when you peel back the layers you know for me it was i was petrified of potentially contaminating someone else and causing harm again. It was about what if I'm responsible? What if I'm the reason that that person gets sick? What if something happens to them? Um, I couldn't bear it. I just couldn't bear it. So if I can work with that core fear and, and actually lean into that and say, right, okay, I'm okay with being you know, imperfect. I'm okay with if people leave. If people don't accept me for who I am, then, you know, it's not a reflection on me. It's a reflection on, you know, that we're just not compatible in that way. And there'll be people that, that will accept me. You know, there are so many people in my life now that, you know, love me warts and all. Um, and I've, you know, over the years, you know, moved away from people that maybe liked me for the surface level, liked me for the, the per- perfection that I kind of displayed, the person that didn't have problems, the person that didn't have emotions, that just kind of was a people pleaser. Um, I don't feel sad about that though. I don't, because again, I think, you know, you can, you should look at your friendships, look at your life as, you know, it's quality over quantity. Um, but yeah, so that was really, really the turning point for me in, in terms of how I was going to kind of tackle it from that root, root place. Um, but in terms of how you motivate yourself to get to that point, how do you make yourself care? How do you, you know, believe in yourself enough how do you you know find the strength to say to yourself right you know what I deserve to recover and I'm going to invest in this for me it was reparenting it was reparenting practices I I had to really connect back with that part of myself that had decided that I was bad the part of me that had decided that I was unlovable that I was unworthy that part and through doing that that's really when I started to see transformation because, and it's not, again, this is not a quick fix, right? Anybody that tells you that there's a quick fix to, you know, recovering and uh, getting to a good place with yourself and with your OCD, you know, I would be skeptical, you know, I'd be very cynical about that. Um, It takes work, you know, it does take time, but I had to go back. I had to, you know, get back in touch with the emotions I was feeling and, and a great way to do this you know uh, David Hawkins uh, has a great book called Letting Go that I really recommend um, but it really comes back to somatic experiencing and getting back in touch with what can you feel in your body what can you feel when you're you know triggered when you're feeling uh, an emotional surge 
finding out, you know, where in your body can you feel it? You know, how does it feel? How does it, you know, how does it move in your body? You know, does it have a texture? Does it have a temperature? Really getting back in touch with your inner world and moving out of your head, right? Because we can't rationalize, we can't argue our way out of OCD. It's an illogical, <laughs> complex disorder. We have to go back to, to the root and really get back in touch with the discomfort that we normally want to avoid. Once you've found that, once you've identified that, leaning into it welcoming up no longer resisting it because by resisting things what we do is we communicate hey this is something to be feared this is something that's dangerous so we escalate the problem we make it far more of a a threat in our mind i'm not saying it is a threat in reality but it becomes bigger right it's like the monster in the cupboard where you know if you don't turn the light on eventually the monster has your fangs and free heads and you know it becomes this really really big thing and if we just have the courage to switch that light on, we, we might find that it's a, a coat and a hoover. So again, it's, you know, leaning into that and then chasing it back. When was the time before that I felt this? When was the time before? Can I remember perhaps the first time? And when we can connect with that, maybe that first time or that earliest time when we, we remember feeling those exact sensations, connecting with that part, validating their experience, right? Not trying to fix them, not trying to change them or remove those feelings because they might have not been able to express that at the time. That might be part of the problem, the fact that they had to mask, that they had to push it down. But instead, we're saying to them, no, if you're sad, that's okay. You know, be sad. I'm sad too. What happened? It sucked. Or if they're angry, you know, it's it's okay that you're angry. I feel angry too. This, this, there was injustice here, and I'm so sorry you went through it. And then really asking them what they need to find resolution. Asking them how can you and me together make our peace with this, find meaning in this, move away from this, reframe it. How can we, you know, change the image? But perhaps they need you to step in as the the wise present day you and say what they couldn't say or remove them. Perhaps they need to grow tall like a giant and just look yeah. down on those involved and feel powerful whatever they need that's what you ideally want to help them to do and then eventually the goal is to to build that relationship to build that trust and to offer them the wisdom and the parenting and we say parenting as a you know a term of you know nurturing offering them kind of guidance the, the guidance they needed that they might might not have received um, and with that comes change because you start to become an ally you start to love yourself again um and trust me this is coming from a person who um i used to really struggle with body dysmorphia um i used to really really struggle with for example looking in mirrors i I hated the way i looked i I cover them um and now i mean i'm speaking to you uh in front of uh, you know a lot of lovely people and you know i'm putting myself you know my face out there um which is something that i never thought i could do prior to doing this self-work so it really can really can change the way that you view yourself and, and make you make you feel so much better about yourself oh yeah no but there's so much in there uh that is so useful to explore and, and thank you uh for sharing that because i see tote sage in the chat has also want you know wants to pass along thank you for sharing oh, that story the uh and yeah maybe we'll, we'll cover because there's a couple of comments in the chat we'll cover those mm-hmm. too but i wanted to catch you up what you're explaining there it, it is something i found so useful too even mm-hmm. so i always i always think of it not as uh i don't call it reparenting i always think of it as babysitting the, uh, but i'm like the cool babysitter like yeah. i've got to take my younger self to go we're going to an amusement park or something like that i'm going to show them how to do like awesome things but yeah because you could see it like you were describing there, you know, at seven years old, you can imagine the logic of a seven year old to control all of these adult things and adults Mm. and uncertainties. Mm. If we went back and asked a seven year old, Hey, like, how should we handle this stuff? They'd have some really cute things to say, but also they wouldn't be that useful to implement Mm. as adults. Yeah. Uh, But that ends up what we're stuck with in our heads at that point. Uh, yeah. So yeah, going back and doing that work like you're describing there, it's mm-hmm. so valuable because yeah, the OCD just becomes this logical way of controlling uncertainty mm-hmm. um, and difficult experiences in the world. Yeah. So yeah, Absolutely. I love that that idea of seeing it as uh, software that needs some yeah. updating. The uh, <laughs> yeah. I'll just grab some of the the comments here in the chat. Yeah. Um, and I think too, this would be a good. I know there was that comment on the Discord about beliefs. 
what you were describing there too gets into yeah. a lot of those beliefs we're carrying around. So maybe let's look at that right after. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, Jesse was just saying here, I've been recently applying mindfulness whenever ruminating comes mm -hmm. on and I steer myself back to the present moment. It's yeah. been helping me to teach my brain that's what we're doing. I don't yeah. really know what the definition of ERP is. I just know your definition of not reacting and doing what you value. Mm -hmm. uh, does the brain relearn from ERP too? Yeah, how, how would you describe ERP, Noah? Because I, I think this yeah. is, it's very common to now that, yeah, I know you do the same, like we'll, we'll talk about ERP and ACT as yeah. kind of a together thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, how would you describe it? I would say, you know, ERP is, is a way to, you know, rewire your, your threat level that you've associated to a particular obsession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're exposing ourselves, which would be, you know, sitting with the, the, the fear, the, 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 the feeling, you know, we often talk about, you know, thoughts being an intrusion, but, you know, your, your intrusions can be emotions, urges, mm -hmm. um, statements, in fact, rather than just what ifs. Um, all memories um, but sitting with that leaning into the uncertainty of it without engaging in a compulsion which is you know response prevention um, and you know how we would normally you know how you track it would be to start with building a hierarchy so you know rating the the different obsessions and compulsions that you experience uh from low to medium to high um because it's really important as well you never jump in at the kind of top tier stuff you know you don't run before you can walk build up confidence go at a pace that works for you and soon you'll build that momentum and it will become easier as you go through but ideally what you want to do is you really want to be present with the anxiety and and you can track it so you can you know have you know, how was your anxiety distress level out of 100 at, say, the beginning, and then at the middle, and then at the end. And uh, some people find it really helpful to also time it. Um, and that really gives you that, that kind of ability to kind of look back, because often what happens with exposure is we can, you know, we live in a world where everyone wants instant gratification with social media, we're always kind of swiping and wanting new content. Um, and that can really be the, the case with recovery. Often we want kind of quick results, but sometimes we can disqualify the positives and we can almost miss the progress we're making. So tracking it can be really helpful to look back and say, oh, okay, you know, when I first did this, it was an 80 out of a hundred when I face this fear, but now, it's a, a 60 and, and that's a massive progress, right? And in addition to that, not only was there a massive drop in, in kind of anxiety from beginning it, but in addition, I also did it in half the time. So that's really kind of the general gist and, and why this works is because the more that we engage in compulsions be, to begin with, obviously we're becoming reliant on compulsions. We're becoming almost, I like to call OCD being an anti-anxiety uh, addict. So we become addicted to certainty. It's almost like heroin to us. Um, but we become addicted to feeling good feelings, feeling calm, feeling certain, feeling sure of ourselves, feeling secure. And so much so that anything that is less than perfect flags up the the fight flight response we become panic stricken and we think that you know everything is falling apart so really the process of exposing yourself erp is about learning to habituate to that that discomfort around these topics but as a result of doing that we're actually teaching the brain okay this is unpleasant but we're surviving and every time we sub survive that we slowly start to build confidence in our ability to sit with that experience, right? Um, so there's another kind of really helpful technique if, if people are struggling with that is delayed response. So often with, with exposure, we tend to look at it as, you know, you do an exposure and then you would stop the exercise, say, when you had reduced your anxiety by 50%. Again, it's not about completely eradicating the anxiety, but reducing it significantly. But for some people, that feels really unmanageable. So you can start with delayed response, which is, you know, you set a time and you say, I'm not going to do a compulsion for five minutes. You know, And if that's too high, go for two minutes, you know. It's really a, a very personal journey. You have to be really honest with yourself where you're at. It should be challenging. Absolutely, you should feel 
anxiety enough that you're exposing yourself but you should never get to a point where it's so overwhelming that you lose momentum and you kind of buckaroo yourself you know you should build up to that um something that i really um really res- you know recommend and i use personally something that really helped me was in addition a technique called paradoxical intention um which derives from uh, logotherapy, which was developed by uh, psychiatrist Viktor Frankl, um, who wrote an incredible book, again, another one that I would recommend, Man's Search for Meaning. Um, He was a survivor of a concentration camp in the 1940s, and he had, he'd lost his, um, he'd lost his entire family. Uh, All of his family had had not managed, sadly, to make it through. Um, And his kind of you know his ethos for local therapy was about finding meaning and also taking you know the power away from from our phobias so within that one of the techniques is paradoxical intention which works paradoxically you know it is kind of what it says on the tin which is that we work to will and wish and lean into the things that we fear and that might sound really kind of strange because often the the kind of knee-jerk thing to do with OCD is to say no I don't want to do it you know that's not me that's not me you know I would never do that I'd never think that you know and again it's understandable we've all at some point we've all done it you know in the beginning when you're struggling with OCD but the purpose of paradoxical intention, and within this, there's an element of exposure. That's why I kind of mentioned it, being that you're exposing yourself to the, the fear by willing and wishing yourself to experience the, this experience of being triggered and of using humor to escalate and agree. So how this works is, you know, if your brain, if you're doing a compulsion and you're avoiding your, your fear, you're teaching the brain this is something dangerous. This is something that is wrong, is bad. You shouldn't be experiencing this. We need to remove this, eradicate it, get rid of it entirely, right? And so whenever it occurs, it, there's a bigger fear. There's a far greater fear because you know, you've know, you taught yourself, you've conditioned yourself to believe that you, you need to be this, this kind of robotic level of perfection where you, can't, you control every thought that pops into your head, every experience. Um, but really, what we want to do is we want to say to your brain, you know, hey, this is not only is this not scary, it's so not scary and so insignificant that I, you know, I want to experience this. In fact, I want to make it worse. I want yep. to make it so silly. You know, an example I like to use, you know, a kind of safer example, you know, we can go into all sorts of different themes. It works across the board. But an example I like to always come back to, it comes, it comes out all the time whenever I'm doing an example, um, is uh, what if I had a thought about kicking a puppy, right? So it's a nice kind of, you know, obviously I apologise for anyone that is a real animal lover and that if that's triggering. But um, if you, for example, in this, this scenario, if what if I had a thought about kicking a puppy? How I would use the technique would be, I'd say, you know, of course, why wouldn't I want to kick a puppy? They're awful. I'm terrible. In fact, I want to, you know, I want to be like Coella de Vil. I want to go out and kick all the puppies, right? So we're, we're playing with that idea. And again, it, it might make you feel that kind of knee-jerk kind of resistance and, and kind of anxiety. But always remember, especially with logotherapy, it's about finding the meaning in your suffering so we know that when we go into these exercises we are going in with the intention we're going in with a purpose which is that we want to teach your brain to lower the threat level that has been associated to that fear we want to tell your brain okay it might not be comfortable but you can you can survive this right it can also be applied to the physical experience of anxiety. So we can reframe how we're experiencing anxiety sensations. So I don't know, you know, when you're feeling, you know, excited, you might find that you have a pounding heart or you're sweating or you you have racing thoughts because you're so excited. And we don't question these experiences. When we have them, we we celebrate them, we lean into them, we, we think they're great. But we can experience very similar experiences in our body that are associated to our feared narrative, our OCD fear story, to our anxiety, and we become resistant to them. We don't want to experience them. And we teach our brain again, hey, this is bad, this is dangerous, we shouldn't feel it. So what we would do with paradoxical intention, with logotherapy, would 
be to use linguistics to reframe the experience of being triggered, to start to teach your brain again, hey, not only is this okay, it's so okay that I want to experience it and I'm enjoying experiencing it. And as a result, the brain goes, hmm, okay, well, mm, you seem to be kind of wanting this and enjoying this. It can't be that bad. Okay, maybe it's not what we first thought. Right. Okay. We'll, we'll reassess the, the the kind of threat level that we've we've attached. Maybe it's not what we thought. So you could use that. You know, you could say instead of having a pounding heart and being like, oh god, you know, I can't I can't catch my breath. You could say, oh, I've got uh, I've got butterflies in my stomach. You know, my heart's racing. I'm so giddy. Right. So it's the language we're using is different. We're putting a different spin on it. We're changing the meaning. We're still experiencing the same thing, but we're we're leaning into it. We're, we're reframing it through the language and through our, our understanding of it. And as a result, we're, we're starting to, to be defuse from the, the feared story and we're also starting to rewire. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that, <laughs> that answers the, uh, the question, but yeah, yeah that no, would be. Thank you Sorry. for explaining that. That's great. Okay. The, you know, the, I found that last technique you were describing, I found so useful. It was so helpful you know, to see often it's about me taking that mm-hmm. younger self uh, yeah, to the amusement park on a roller coaster yeah. and seeing, yeah, I get it. Right now my brain thinks the roller coaster is terrifying and it's like, mm-hmm. no, bad things will happen. Mm-hmm. We'll vomit, we'll fall out. This is a bad thing. And, and really turning the brain and saying, no, like this is exciting. Like that feeling is actually a rush and we... Mm-hmm want it and but yeah at first that's so it's so weird I love the term paradoxical intention because that yeah yeah it is recognizing everything in your body is saying no don't do this and you're Mm -hmm. saying oh no actually this is the indicator that we we want to go and do more of this yeah and then the brain starts to go oh I I, I, I was wrong about that. Okay, okay. Yeah. I don't we're, have to keep worrying about that. We're psychologying the brain. We're like exactly. the brain, the exact opposite of what, what it would normally want to hear. Mm-hmm. But we're kind of, you know, we're, we're one step ahead. You know, we're two, we're two steps ahead. Um, but you know, funny enough, with, um, with Viktor Frankl, he had a case study that was mm. I found fascinating. He had um, a particular uh, client that he'd worked with, a young boy, who had a stutter, he'd had a stutter his whole life. Um, And this stutter, I might add for this example, was it was caused by psychosomatic um, condition. It wasn't wasn't down to any sort of kind of neurological um, condition. Um, But he had suffered for years with this debilitating stutter and he'd become very fearful and embarrassed about experiencing it. He was so scared that he just stopped kind of communicating because he was always thinking, what if I stutter and people judge me? What if people ridicule me? They don't want to be around me. So how Viktor Frankl helped this, this uh, individual was he, he used the technique of paradoxical intention. He said to him, I want you to go onto a train and I want you to deliberately stutter to solicit sympathy from the train conductor so you can get a free train ticket. Now, because the boy had a purpose and he wanted, he did want to stutter because he wanted this free train ticket, he found in this particular case that he, he couldn't stutter. He couldn't make himself do it. Um, because again, the, the obstacle, the fear that was keeping that, that cycle going was the fear of judgment and the fear of not wanting it to happen sometimes when we don't want something to happen it's far more likely to occur because we're again focusing our mindset on what if it happens right that you know when you look at the brain how it's how it functions there's a a filtration system in the brain called the reticular activating system now this is how we kind of, you know, we can remember our names and we can remember our mobile numbers and it's, it's super helpful, but it can get hijacked by the things that we're, we're fearful of. So if you've got a person, say, that has uh, had an experience with, you know, maybe they got attacked by a dog when they were younger. If that person walks down the street, they might be looking out, you know, hearing dog barks in the distance. They might be, you know, they might see the dog walk across the road. They might be very hypervigilant and focused on that dog walk, right? Now, somebody else might walk down that street that hasn't had that experience. They might walk down the same street and they might be looking at the clouds and thinking, oh, you know, I hope it doesn't rain when I go to the barbecue later on, or, you know, oh, you know, what am I going to pick up a bottle of wine? Or They could be thinking and all, all manner of things, but they're not likely focusing on the dogs right which person's you know reality is is more real you know 
which person is ex, you know experiencing the correct reality the the point here is that the street is the same right the street has not changed but the person's interpretation the person's focus point has been has been hijacked has been fixated on a topic based upon the fact that they're already fearful of something they're already wired to perhaps maybe worry there's an anticipatory anxiety which is huge in OCD you know I get so many people saying to me you know I have I'm anxious about being anxious I you know what if it happens when I'm at this station right (laughs) so I yeah and you know it sounds like you you probably get a lot of people as well that that say that but um but yeah, so if we're wiring ourselves to have this anticipatory anxiety to focus on what could go wrong, again, mm. what we're teaching the brain is this is important, yeah. right? The way I look at the reticular activating system, again, going back to your mind being a computer, imagine it's like a desktop and that's like a shortcut that's been created because your, your computer brain has decided, oh, this is something you access regularly. It's something that's important to you. It doesn't mean it is important. It doesn't mean that the topic itself is, is of high value, but you have at some point placed value on it, whether that be because it's triggering or because it's your phone number and you need it to be you know, easy to, to kind of pull out at a drop of a hat. Either way, we teach ourselves that certain things are of higher value. And so we become far easy, better at plucking that information and focusing on things that, that kind of surround that topic. Um, yeah, so that's why, you know, when you kind of think about, if I said to you, um, you know, the orange, the color orange or the, the you know, the fruit orange is dangerous. If I said yeah. to you, do, you know, do not avoid with all your, all you can, do not go and find, you know, any orange, it's dangerous. I guarantee you, you will start noticing orange far more, right? Mm-hmm. You'll start noticing the color, noticing the fruit, because I've told you it's important and, and perhaps you've you've heard it and you've registered it and it's become a shortcut on the on the computer. Totally right. Especially if we add into that, oh, people are gonna hate you if you miss yeah. an orange. And they're like, yeah. oh, okay. And also I've gotta I've gotta catch the orange because if I miss it, other people are gonna get attacked by the orange. I'm gonna be the mm-hmm. one responsible. Oh yeah the brain of course then it's gonna we're gonna (laughs) imagine we saw oranges we're gonna think something we're gonna see something that's red and we're gonna be oh i don't how orange what if it becomes orange that's just yeah the brain is just trying to protect you and this and i know you're a big fan of fruit as well sorry huge huge (laughs) fan of fruit but i always feel it's so useful to to recognize that because sometimes we approach these things like intrusive thoughts and stuff like that as though oh no there's one there's something wrong with the brain and also it's 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 very separate from me but yeah the brain is doing what it's supposed to and then we we put on top this layer like Mm. you're describing there as a filter of like here's the things to watch out for yeah Um, and then it's yeah it's totally natural that we think about them and i think this is a a leading because i want to cover this question uh Pupper Potato shared a uh, long time mm. uh, viewer was checking out your Instagram the other day and they wanted to ask about beliefs. And I think beliefs are an interesting mm. kind of intersection with this. Cause of course, if we have a belief about something like oranges are bad, you must never mm. be responsible for a bad thing yeah. happening. Mm-hmm. And of course it, it comes up with this stuff. And so you had mentioned a bunch of beliefs. You had an, an Instagram post I thought yeah. was great. You just talked about beliefs that fuel OCD um, you mm-hmm. talked about, I'm unlovable, I'm evil, yeah. I'm bad, I'm responsible mm-hmm. for letting the oranges by, I'm dangerous, I'm not enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how did you and your journey start to notice those beliefs? And then how do you tackle beliefs? Mm-hmm. So for myself, I think that's a really great question as well. So thank you for that question. Um, in terms of how I started to identify my beliefs, mm-hmm. um, it was very much through inner work so again through letting go practices through shadow work um through inner child work really starting to look at what was triggering me in the present that's a really really great place to start because we can all access that you know you know you'll be an expert on what triggers you so start to look at what's triggering you in the present and then start to chase that back think of this is being an archaeologist. We're going, we're digging and we're peeling back layers and we're trying to discover what's at the bottom um, and, and start to kind of question, you know, why is that? You know, why am I scared of this? 
what does that say about me as well? This is a really big one. Let's flip it around because often when we're exploring the, the fears that we have, we often kind of will think about, you know, other people, you know, we'll think about, you know, oh, I need to make sure that I'm, you know, doing this because other people might think this, but actually what does it make you feel about yourself, right? So if you're experiencing harm thoughts or you're experiencing RCD or a particular real event, you know, or a false memory or, you know, any, any theme, you know, what does it, what does it make you feel about yourself? You know, and then really follow that through. You know, why do you feel that about yourself? What does that make you feel about yourself? You know, look at this as as the the kind of tip of the iceberg, and we're slowly but surely working our way down to the point where what can happen. And again, this isn't about pushing something. You know, a lot of inner work is is very organic and and is a process. It's a practice and a skill. So don't expect you know to have one session where you reach out to your inner child or you sit with your emotions and all of the answers kind of bubble up to the surface you can have that you know you can have real releases but you can also have times where there's apathy and resistance and when that comes up really using the the curiosity and the the kind of questioning techniques again with that what is it that I'm, you know, scared to go into? Because when we look at apathy as a covering emotion, right? What is apathy trying to prevent you from feeling? Often apath- apathy comes in when it feels as though we can't handle what's underneath it, right? It's almost like a cap that, that shuts off. So again, asking yourself, you know, what is it about this obsession that really kind of upsets me? following it through and getting to the point where you find that that belief and it will eventually come you know when I used my example of my relationship OCD again it was a process I did a post quite it was quite a while back called the OCD seed that's what I like to call it but it was um, a drawing that really kind of kind of I think quite clearly represents like the kind of thought process for how I figured it out being that the seed was when, you know, at that point when I was, you know, seven and it was very dysfunctional, you know, what was going on for me and my dad leaving. Um, and then I chased it through. So I went, okay, from that point, where did, where did I kind of go from there? What happened? What happened? And then as it kind of spiraled through and I added all of these different points in my journey, I realized where it had sprouted up. So I was able to then kind of see that point and then be able to question and investigate well that inciting incident that original wound how did that make me feel about myself oh it made me feel unworthy and unlovable okay right so I felt unlovable unworthy again going back to reparenting I had to at a certain point go back to that that innocent little seven-year-old that was waiting at the doorstep for a dad to send her a birthday card that never came and um I had to sit with her and I had to console Mm -hmm. her and I had to say to her you know this is not a reflection on you this is not a reflection on who you are in fact this is only a reflection on his inability to parent you and to be you know maybe he wasn't emotionally capable of offering that that it's not about me demonizing him but he obviously you know had his own things going on and he wasn't able to be what I needed um but I could be what I needed you know yes. that's the, the kind of beauty in in this work I had to sit with myself and I had to kind of speak to myself on that level in addition to that something that can be really helpful is to communicate to this part of yourself this interaction this point whatever it was when you decided that that you were unlovable you were unworthy you were responsible communicate to yourself that this event or these interactions or these people do not guarantee that other interactions, other people, other situations will be the same, will offer the same results. Because often, again, when we experience trauma, specifically, you know, when we're really young and we don't have this kind of maturity and, and, and understanding, we can almost create these black and white rules, you know? Mm-hmm we live in these cognitive distortions of you know all or nothing thinking and I think at a certain point what happened for me is I had made a rule that everybody leaves and that it was all my fault and it you know we know that that that's very heavily distorted you know the reality is is that I I I didn't have any part to play in my parents relationship coming to an end you know they were adults and they were responsible for their own relationship I was a child um, and and I had to kind of grow up and too soon and become an adult 
far too young. Um, but at the time, that was my belief. So really, we have to kind of go back with that wisdom, the wisdom I have now to say to myself, hey, no, you know what? <laughs> I'm so sorry that you went through that, but it isn't a reflection on you. That, that in itself is really where you start to kind of work with, you know, healing that, that wound and finding that resolution. But then in addition to that, you have to also replace these beliefs with something better. So yes. again, you have to start to find ways to incorporate the, the newer beliefs, like looking at what, what are your values? What, what is a, you know, a good way to live your life? How is a good way to kind of view yourself? Not just kind of taking things and leaving nothing in its place, but replacing it with something more kind of positive. So for example, you could look at my situation and you could say, you know, it's, there's a, there's an argument to be, you know, be not guarded, but be cautious of people because again you know there are purposes to everything you know if, if I was overly trusting then I would you know go up to anybody and you know I, I, there'd be no sort of kind of warning system for any danger you know human beings yeah. we do need anxiety anxiety does you know to a certain extent you know it serves a, pu- a function right it, you know in the animal kingdom it serves a function to kind of keep us safe from predators but in addition to that it's also a great way to kind of you know, give us messaging to kind of steer us in a direction where we're, you know, more safe. Obviously, we're not talking about a person who's had hijacked anxiety where it's, you know, completely overcome them. But as a, you know, as a rule, human beings do experience emotion, you know, anxiety, and that's, that's perfectly normal. Um, But looking at when I was struggling at that point, saying to myself, okay, so it's not necessarily a case of you, you know, completely never experiencing any anxiety, but knowing that the anxiety is not for you is not something that you need to experience every single time you come into a situation where somebody, you know, reminds you of your dad, right? Because I've severed that connection with it being my fault through the inner work and then replacing it with, okay, looking at, well, actually, you know, I, I'm instilling this confidence in myself. I'm instilling this self-belief in myself that actually I can go forward and validate myself because really what it was, was that I was seeking validation from other people. Right. So a validation from a young age was, it was always sourced from outside from external cues. Um, and it's understandable, right? Because if you've got parents that don't, you know, or situations in your life where you're not encouraged to really kind of be independent of thought to, you know, you, you're kind of either overly kind of controlled or you're kind of, you know, belittled or kind of, you know, undermined in any way, you start to lose trust for yourself. You start to look to everybody else to kind of tell you what you should and shouldn't be thinking, feeling. So I think that, that for me, what I had to do was I had to create a new rule being, hey, no, the validation comes from me. Yes. If people don't like who I am, then obviously, you know, you know, in an ideal world, everybody would think I was awesome. But the reality is, is that I won't be everybody's cup of tea. Um, and I'm sorry for anyone that doesn't, that, you know, that's a very British. Oh, um, yeah. Coffee. We love, it may we love be a tea. cup of coffee. It may be a cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> Same, we, same thing. We just love our tea in the UK. Um, Translate. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, I won't be everybody's cup of tea or coffee, um, but that's okay because if I've got a good connection with myself, if I love myself, um, then that's fine. That's okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, replacing where I'm getting my worth and then, you know, identifying your core values, things that make you feel worthy, things that make you feel good about what you, who you are, what you do the way you live your life rather than looking to external people to kind of give you that. Um, but yeah, I mean, what, what would you say? What, what's your kind of stance on it in terms of that? No, I find what you brought up there is so useful. I found it so valuable in so many different ways, even in ways we mm. typically don't think of as seeking validation. It was mm. so helpful to start to look at what am I trying to get from other people? Yeah. And how can I start to give that to myself? And then the kind of the paradox of that is that then I'm able to approach relationships or kind of so many different situations because so Mm. often we're, yeah, we're reacting to fears about what others will think and there's not even anybody around. Mm. Uh, I could start to approach those situations from a place of giving because I wasn't going there to kind of fill some hole inside of me. Mm. That was, yeah, recognizing that I was whole 
I'm giving myself those things that I've been searching for and yeah. now I can give to others. I love that. I and love so that. yeah, maybe that's, I'd, I'd love to hear how, or yeah, learn how, how do you give to yourself now? So I love that question as well. Um, because again, when you think about recovery, you think, you know, once you're recovered that you never have to do any more self work, but you know, even somebody who doesn't have mental health issues, it's really, it's really good to have mental health hygiene and to totally. continuously kind of be, you know, dating yourself, almost mm -hmm. having a, a good it's relationship a great with yourself. Yeah. Yep. So um, in terms of, you know, after reaching my recovery, it, you know, for me now on a day to day, it's just about, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that I did, it's become automatic now, you know, you know, mm -hmm. that you kind yeah. of have to consciously change your behaviors in the beginning, you have to consciously kind of do these things. And it can almost feel like frustrating, like you're going through the motions, like, when is it going to just click? But eventually it does click and the brain rewires and it becomes your default setting. So a lot of the stuff, you know, the, that I kind of preach is, is stuff that my brain now it automatically will kind of, I'll just laugh, you know, if I have an intrusive thought. And again, you know, up to 93% of the population have intrusive thoughts. People that don't have OCD have intrusive thoughts. The difference being that they don't get stuck on the thoughts. They don't add the additional meaning. They just kind of look at them and might say, oh, that was a bit of a strange one, or, you know, that was a you know, odd one. And then they get back to the day, or they're not even, you know, registering that they've had the thought. You know, we have over 6,000 thoughts a day, and it's pretty difficult to, I mean, I can't even remember what I had for breakfast, but, you know, uh -huh trying to remember, you know, even five thoughts that I've had today, that would be, you know, an ask, that would be a tall, tall ask, but to try and recall like 6,000 thoughts, like, so again, it's like looking at the, the, the practice of, you know, getting back in touch with yourself and looking at the fact that it's not about completely eradicating the thoughts but it's about you know the relationship being different to the thoughts so now the way I live my life is that if I occasionally have an intrusive thought and they are far far less frequent because again I'm you know when we go back to the reticular activating system I'm not wired to look for them anymore so I would say that mm. for me life after you know recovery is that I you know I live a very you know asymptomatic life like I don't I don't tend to get a lot of intrusive thoughts that that stand out they will kind of pass through that filtration system in the odd time when I do get a thought that kind of, you know, will stand out. I'm able to laugh it. I'm able to make light of it. I'm able to kind of ridicule it or kind of just be indifferent to it and be like, oh, okay, yep. cool. And then it moves on, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't get stuck like it used to get stuck. In terms of how I kind of maintain good hygiene around this, I, Obviously, I'm very mindful. I do a lot of meditation. You know, I think that's really important. Um, but in addition, and I know I've mentioned this again, but I would, I cannot stress enough the the letting go practice is so beneficial. Um, and that's really about getting back in touch with your body, getting back in touch with feeling that discomfort, and letting whatever's there just come up because. I like to describe our bodies as being like emotional containers. We're like carrying around all of our feelings, all of our experiences and thoughts. And if we don't, in a healthy way, release them, I'm not talking about us going out and screaming, you know, down the street, screaming blue murder and, you know, kicking up a fuss, but, you know, being able to, you know, use techniques like process work, um, being able to really kind of sit down and be reflective, being able to kind of give ourselves that self-soothing when we need it. If we can't do these things and we don't allow ourselves to do these things, what can happen is that container just keeps getting added to every time something happens it builds and it builds and then what happens is we find ourselves going into you know we have a meltdown or we you know we, we have an outburst and and we feel as though we can't cope because it's like this massive huge container that just we just can't carry it anymore so again for me it's a it was a process you know through recovery of learning to you know desensitize to my emotions and to befriend them start to look at them as being you know messengers and again i'm not saying messages in ter in terms of your ocd feared story because again when people say oh you know what if my my emotions are confirming my my obsession i'm not commenting on that you know first i'm not going to reassure anybody but um 
the, the feared story in itself, right? We're, we're still going down that kind of, you know, we're rationalizing, we're analyzing, we're adding meaning. Emotions don't work in that way, right? We can interpret yeah. emotions in so many different ways. So that's not really the right arm, the question to be asking ourselves. Really, we just want to get back in touch with the body. We, we don't want to be focusing at that point on the thoughts because the thoughts will tell you anything. You know, it can tell you all manner of different things. So getting back in touch with your body and really just being with them, welcoming them up, allowing them to be there, releasing it so that you're able to regulate your emotions, right? regulating emotions is massive 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 um so yeah that that's that's the main kind of gist of it um and also just living a life that follows my value system you know mm -hmm. doing things that make me happy um you know for me when i was really in the thick of ocd my world had become so small i'd stopped going out at one point i just couldn't leave my house mm -hmm. because i was just absolutely know completely um, bombarded with thoughts you know i didn't trust myself to you know walk down the street um and so i stopped seeing friends at one point i didn't think i could have relationships so now you know the freedom that, that i've kind of found are, you know the things that bring me joy you know hanging out with my partner playing you know, game of thrones the board game i, I love doing that you know watching cartoons uh, playing music i love to write you know songs play guitar um, video games recently playing uh, and it's an old game but um, Detroit Become Human um, which is like a multiple choice and it's about androids and it. you know <laughs> I don't know if that's a game that you've come across but I've seen yeah, it incredible game for anyone that hasn't played mm -hmm. it oh yeah but um but yeah so it's it's um yeah it's it's finding joys in life finding things that bring you happiness getting back in touch with with you right getting and, and, and moving away at a certain point from uh, you know, focusing on all of the, the kind of things that were weighing me down because I've been able to kind of let go of those things and, and rediscover Nova 2.0. That is awesome. That is wonderful. And no, maybe that's a, a, a one more question, but that's a kind of a great note to end on as far as the mental health things go because so went to so much of what's I would say awesome or surprising sometimes too with recovery is getting to do all of those things mm. that we couldn't do yeah. before or even mm. there's so many things I do now that I thought were impossible my entire life uh yeah. that is awesome that you get to yeah be Nova now the uh thank so yeah thank you for I'm sharing that <laughs> No, it's yeah it's good well, it's a good time the uh <laughs> what do you this has been a strange year all over yeah. the world uh so maybe mm. yeah just before we close uh what are you most excited about right now in your life no i mean i'm most excited about getting back to a little bit more normality in, you know, in the kind of the, the situation in the world, being able to kind of start to kind of go on a bit more adventures. I really, I love exploring. Uh, that's a really, yeah. a really important thing for my value system is kind of going on adventures with my partner. So really getting back out in nature. Um, I, I just love being in nature. It's such an important thing. And grounding is so important as well. Um, but really just continuing to, to kind of speak to, you know, people in the community and to, to be able to kind of help other people um, and hopefully get people, you know, you know, as we've just said, you know, our, our worlds are, are such night and day from what we experienced when we were going through this. So basically yeah. continuing on the path of helping people to reach that, um, to get the lives that they deserve and, and to get that freedom. Oh, How that, about you, by the way? What, what, what are your kind of hopes for, for life going forward? Yeah, what am I, I think I'm, we've been on lockdown for a while here. And so I think uh, I am just really excited to, uh, yeah, be with people again that maybe I haven't seen in a long time. I love as part of, you know, yeah. the work I do, doing workshops and, and, uh, bringing yeah. people together around these skills. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, yeah, bringing people together again. It's been great to connect with people online over the past year, uh, but also uh, it's always so wonderful to, uh, you know, go for a picnic, go out with a group of friends to do oh, something. Yeah. 
um, go. Uh, I love doing meditation retreats. Of course, no meditation retreats have been happening oh, uh, anywhere. So yeah, I'm looking forward to, uh, yeah, go go be quiet in a temple for a couple of weeks is uh, always a good that sign. That sounds so good. <laughs> That sounds incredible. Well, hopefully it's going to, you know, it's going to start to happen soon and, and everybody's going to start to be able to go out and, and, and start doing things that they enjoy doing and, and seeing all of their loved ones. Like that would be such a wonderful thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, but yeah, keep, keep doing all of the incredible, you know, streams that you're doing because you, you're creating out of all of this. I imagine it's probably encouraged you to do even more kind of, you know, content, you know, we're, we've all been kind of more focused on work probably as a result of not being able to go out. But I think, you know, it's definitely done done such a great thing for the OCD community to have you probably stuck inside making all the great content that you make <laughs> no thank Still you and <laughs> thank you for everything you do uh, because even I know there's there were some follow-up questions uh in the chat online but maybe I know you, you joined the the discord server the other day but also you're on Instagram you're on YouTube as well um if anybody wants to follow up with you on any of the topics you discussed where can they find you yeah yeah so i'm on instagram at ocd uh, dot freedom is everything and i'm on youtube now i've just started a youtube account so that's ocd thumbs up um yeah that's that's where you can find me and um yeah my dms are open as well so please feel free to throw me a, a question or two and you know tell me how you're getting on in your recoveries i love to hear how people are doing I don't know if it did this for everybody else, but for me, just as you were sharing your YouTube URL, it cut out. Could you just share oh, where you are yeah, on so, YouTube again? Sorry. Yeah. yeah, sure. If you type in uh, Nova Sutton OCD, um, it, it should come up um, with my YouTube channel. And, and it's a new channel, but um, I am starting to kind of upload weekly videos. So stay tuned. Great. Thank awesome. you so much, Mark. It's been lovely chatting with you. As uh, Nova, always, um, yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing uh, so many insights from your adventures. Thank uh, you. The, aven- the your adventures brain. of Nova. <laughs> yeah, but thank it you. It is wonderful. So much. And I know a whole bunch. Again. Oh, absolutely. I know a whole bunch of people in the chat are saying uh, thank you as well and really oh, appreciate it. Everyone. Everything. Um, yeah, I see Gabby just said there, always a pleasure hearing such valuable insights from, oh, wonderful humans. Gabby, you are a wonderful human. Oh, thank uh, you so much. And uh, yeah, I see Tosage saying there, let's all go trick our brains. Absolutely. <laughs> 100%. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for being so kind, yeah. everyone in the comments. And yeah, thank you.